So both of the last two talks touched at least on this concept of a focused research organization. So uh, what Sumner talked about with ultrasound on a chip in the brain, um, that's a focused research organization called Forest. Um, and then Andrew talked about E11 with uh, doing barcode mapping. So those are both focused research organizations or FROs. And part of what I want to convey in this talk is like, why is this whole area of neurotech, whole brain emulation, you know, BCI, why is this so ripe for focused research organizations, right? Because different areas of science are going to have different bottlenecks. You know, maybe quantum gravity, we're just limited by some really brilliant person to like come up with the next theoretical idea. So wh why, why do we feel that large parts of neuroscience are sort of limited by this FRO, FRO shape of problem? And then what are other examples? Um, these are definitely not meant to be exhaustive. I think this group could come up with lots of other ideas for, for FROs. But what are some examples of other neuroscience problems that are kind of part of a larger, let's say, roadmap or agenda of unblocking neuroscience to achieve these different goals um, that you know, would, would make sense as, as FROs? And in, in thinking about this, um, basically our inspiration is things like the Hubble Space Telescope or the Large Hadron Collider at CERN or the Human Genome Project. Why is this our inspiration? I mean, basically, these are projects that are making, they're big engineering projects. They're not fundamentally scientific advances in and of itself. There's not a discovery that is the Hubble Space Telescope. These are tools, they're systems, they're data sets. They're really feats of human coordination and engineering and teamwork um, that is, is what is behind these types of projects. And the, the question that we are interested in really is, OK, well, why are there so few of these? And if you look at things like Hubble or CERN uh, or Human Genome Project, I mean, it's, it's a little bit distorted, right? Because these are all you know, multi-billion dollar, you know, decadal mega projects that you know, all the astronomers basically have to agree every 10 years. You know, what are we going to do in the next 10 years? And like, if Hubble is on the list, hopefully in that 10-year period, you know, you'll, get, you'll, get some, you'll get something done with the cooperation of like, multiple governments, right? Um, you know, is this just a matter that all the projects in this category are like billion dollar mega projects that require governments? Or is there something else going on that says, okay, uh, what's the rate limiting uh, factor for sort of creating these projects that are more engineering projects or teamwork oriented projects to unblock uh, some type of research fields? Um, and our hypothesis is that uh, it's, it's not really uh, m exactly money, right? It's not that each of these need to be billion dollar projects. There are projects that might be 15 or 20 people, right? Like look at E11 Bio, um, is, is just a group of people in a lab in Alameda. But there's, there's an obstacle in our current institutional structure in forming even that level of teamwork within the existing institutions. And so let me try to explain why that is. Um, if you look at many of these neuroscience problems, like think about this problem of making ultrasound on a chip that has to function inside of somebody's skull. Um, that's fundamentally an engineering problem. That's a teamwork problem. You need professional device engineers, professional chip designers, medical device packaging, software. All these things have to work together. Um, it looks like a kind of deep tech product driven company. Um, but the research field that it's operating in right, is at a stage where the thing you need to use that product for is to make discoveries. Right? You need to put that in the hands of neurosurgeons and neuroscientists, understand how these brain disorders work before you can necessarily say, OK, this is the product. And even if you had the product, you actually want to make it as widely accessible to research as possible to sort of feed back into the research process. Um, so it's not a traditional startup, uh, VC-backed type startup, um, let's say large consumer market or something like that, or, or large you know, known medical device indication. But it still needs that team structure that you would associate with uh, engineering-driven, team-driven um, enterprise. Um, most of neuroscience is funded in academic labs. Um, those academic labs, you know, create absolutely fundamental, you know, necessary advances. And if you want fodder on which, you know, it wouldn't make sense to do focused research organizations if you didn't also have thousands of academic labs making individual discoveries on this. But those labs, right, I was in a hundred person lab uh, when I did my PhD, but still the unit size of teamwork was like two or three people, because that's how many co-first authors you can have on a paper, right? <laughs> um, seriously. Um, and so even in very well, large and well-funded academic labs, you don't have this division of labor that you would see in a deep tech startup uh, to build systems. Um, so that's basically uh, why observing a number of bottlenecks in neuroscience, where neuroscience is just so complicated, the brain is so huge in some sense, that um, you know, the, the neuroscientists can't build their own tools, right? You need professional chip designers to make that ultrasound chip. 
and so you need a different structure. Um, and so that's where the FRO uh, idea comes from, and so it's meant to be filling an institutional gap at the intersection of this, this Venn diagram, so academic research um, is kind of exemplary of a class of things that are best for basic science and public goods creation. Um, startups maybe are best for sort of that tight coordination, focus, speed. Um, and then, you know, maybe corporate research labs, let's say, are best, as we're seeing in AI right now, for like really scaling things up and applying a lot of resources um, and structure to an, to an individual project. How do you apply all of those principles in early stage technology development? For neuroscience is one of the fields where I think there's going to be the most of these. It's not just neuroscience. Um, and so because it's not just neuroscience, we've been trying to prototype this model in a variety of different fields. We have some. Um, we even have one that's on software that is used by mathematicians, because again, the mathematicians are not going to make their own um, professional grade software. Um, we have some in climate uh, measurement and data for the climate system, another just vast system where imagine you're an individual climate researcher, you're not going to be able to create the scale of software engineering you need to actually tackle climate problems. Um, and then we have uh, some neuroscience and some biomedical problems. Uh, so Andrew already talked about E11 uh, with barcoding of neurons. And some are already talked about uh, ultrasound, so I'll skip these. Um, so what, what are some of the categories of things in the future? So what's the intuition of why neuroscience is so ripe uh, for, for many more of these FROs? Are these just two isolated examples? Or if we had a lot more resources, you know, could we absorb a lot more into the FRO model? Um, and so I'll give you just a couple different categories uh, where I think this, this type of approach is needed. Um, the first one is like what I call Rosetta Brain. So let me explain what, what that means. Um, there's many biomedical applications of the types of things we're talking about, but in this group, we're thinking about whole brain emulation, thinking about BCI, thinking about AI. Let's just talk about the sort of the, the compu computational aspect, right? How do we map this giant, complex, you know, 100 billion neuron object onto some kind of coherent computational paradigm? And I think this is extremely limiting, even for some of the biomedical applications like BCI, right? A lot of what we're doing is we're sticking in electrodes. And we, it's, it's almost like you're trying to interface with a computer without knowing like which part is the CPU, which part is the memory, which is the input, which is the output. We're just sticking in wires and trying to deconvolute all that. With better kind of mapping between the computation and the biological circuits, you could actually target the inputs, you know, with inputs, <laughs> and that would be really great. Um, so this is an area where um, I really think, broadly speaking, a lot of the bottlenecks are experimental. They're on how do you generate the data in a scalable way. So I don't think it's theoretically bottlenecked, which is an interesting thing. You might say, well, figuring out how the brain works, that's just going to require you know, the next Einstein to figure that out. I actually don't think this is quite true. So there's a number of really interesting good ideas. This is a paper from 2010 or so um, from Dilip George and the vicarious people that are now part of DeepMind about how you know, maybe, maybe the brain is doing Bayesian inference with a particular circuit mapping that they have onto the cortical cell types. But how do we know if that's actually true, right? We don't have a way of ground truthing that. Um, this is uh, something from Steve Burns that Andrew also mentioned. I think this is a really interesting theory about how the different brain areas interact. Basically, if you imagine the cortex is like some learning system, it's a little bit analogous to the transformers that we're training in AI. What's, what's the reward signal? What's the cost function? What's the actual learning signal that's driving that learning? There's ideas about this, but how do we actually map that onto the actual biology? I think if we could do that, it would just have huge implications. It would have implications for how we deal with psychology and these psychiatric disorders, what they even are. It would have implications for AI alignment. We're just very, we're seeing a very small fraction of the brain. And that's because the brain is just super huge. So this is maybe one of the best like overall neuroanatomy summary papers that I've seen. You know, hundreds of different cortical cell types, different regions, long range and short range connections interspersed with each other. Those individual neurons, right, that might be going from one side of your brain to the other over many centimeters, they can thin down, you know, smaller than the wavelength of light, right, to, you know, 100 nanometer range sizes. So if you just think about this as a physical problem, right, we're just trying to physically acquire the data from this three-dimensional hunk of material. Um, that's an incredibly difficult engineering problem. So that's basically why we need the need, need throw-style efforts. Um, on the smaller end of that scale, this is an individual synaptic vesicle. So when any anytime one of your neurons fires, um, it uh, transmits neurotransmitter, you know, into the synapse. Um, those individual synaptic vesicles, little little um, bundles of neurotransmitter, they all have hundreds of different proteins on them that may be different between different types of synapses and connections. So how do we actually access all that? 
And so one kind of unifying concept for that also is that it's not enough to like take one neuron from one brain and say, okay, um, here's how its synapses behave, and then take another brain and say, oh, this one learns something. I know, you know, how does its you know, glial cells behave or something like that. You really need all of this unified uh, in a single brain where you can relate the different levels. So what's, how does the activity relate to the connections, right? How does the connections relate to the gene expression? Um, so that's this idea of our sort of Rosetta brain or Rosetta stone for the brain would be the technology allow you to do activity, behavior, connectome, development, expression, all in a single workflow or system that could be applied on a single brain. So I think that's kind of the dream um, of which some of these different technologies are ultimately a part. So with that, okay, so what are the, some of the other um, FRO-shaped projects that would then contribute to that in, in, in aggregate and let, let you do something like that? Um, so one of, one of the things that we haven't talked about that much is like activity mapping. So, so we talked about the connections between neurons um, and also some of their molecular properties, so basically the wiring. And we talked you know, at, at the level of forest about kind of in a human brain, how do you kind of real time interact with let's say groups of neurons um, and sort of talk to them in real time. Um, but what you really want is like a, a cellular resolution movie of all the neurons turning on and off um, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the single cell level of resolution. So this is kind of another big area of, sort of brain activity mapping. This is actually what in many ways inspired the entire Obama Brain Initiative, which then became a much more distributed, broader kind of funding uh, opportunity. Um, but how do you actually map all the neurons simultaneously? And I think there is, um, there's been some really good academic work where you can actually take little pulses of light and sort of very rapidly scan them across different neurons with something called light beads microscopy. Um, so this is something that people have proposed as a fro to sort of scale that up. Could you map all the neurons, take a movie of all the neurons in a mouse cortex, um, turning on and off and talking to each other in real time? That's not necessarily something you could immediately translate to a human brain computer interface, but some of the principles there would, would be applicable. Um, here's another one uh, which is fun, which is um, in vivo connectomics. So what, what Andrew talked about was you have a, a, a hunk of brain which is preserved um, and you're trying to map these connections. Can you actually map connections between neurons while the thing is still alive? Um, and so we, uh, we have a proposal for, for uh, a fro uh, to do uh, in vivo connectomics, um, scaling up uh, some optical methods. So that would be part of the picture too. How does learning actually work, right? If you could see what, what's the learning rule that the, that the cortex actually uses. If you could see how connections change over time during learning, that's like potentially really key for understanding how the brain relates to AI. So in vivo connectomics. But that's again, this is just a really complicated optics and genetics problem uh, to actually do that. Um, now suppose you're getting all this data, right? Um, what do you, how, do you, how do you test it? How do you relate? Let's say I think I have the learning rule working. You know, how do I actually see if that recapitulates the, the way that mice learn, right? Well, so you basically need to make a virtual mouse with a realistic body and you need a vir you know, realistic you know, spinal cord control of, of its limbs and stuff like that with a brain. So, uh, so we've got a proposal um, to, to do a virtual neuroscience test bed across different organisms, sort of biomechanics, and a test bed for you could imagine training AI on tasks that are animal behavior tasks that are identical to the ones that you ask the mice to do in a neuroscience experiment. You could just do that um, virtually and try to do the comparison much more directly versus having to sort of infer um, based on isolated neuroscience results like how the learning might work. And then an extreme case of this would be to take a, a tiny organism and just do whole brain emulation basically. Um, so, so C. elegans, 302 neurons, um, because it's so small, um, it's still a really challenging problem, but uh, it seems like potentially at least a significant part of this would be a fro-shaped problem to just basically go and upload the C. elegans. It, it, I, I don't have a better way of phrasing it. You would have a somewhat data-driven data simulation of C. elegans, let's say, um, I think would be a, potentially on the horizon. That's, so th those are some of the things in kind of basic analysis of brains. Uh, what about the other category of thing is like human brains. So, uh, so some are talked about using ultrasound, uh, which is really powerful. But what are the other things in that category? How you know is ultrasound the end of the road ultimately? Um, you know what's the kind of research frontier ultimately for for accessing the brain? Um, and so what what uh, Forrest described was um, heavily reliant on being able to put the ultrasound chip on the inside of the skull rather than the outside. 
it's still like a huge open physics and engineering challenge to um, be able to access the brain in a meaningful way um, through the skull um, and non-invasively. And so uh, some of that, I think, can also probably be done with some combination of optics, ultrasound. There's a, there's a whole space of different ideas. DARPA has funded some stuff in this space. But again, uh, it requires a really unified effort. These things are going to require um, totally new chip design, totally new hardware to actually be able to do this. So one of, one of the ideas is something called the lock-in camera with a spatial light modulator atta you know, attached to it on the front to really shape light so that you can counteract the light scattering as it's going through the skull and into the tissue. This is another one where I think it requires um, like dedicated chip design. And part of what's happened is just that you know, our, our current sort of funding system hasn't allocated dedicated chip design to neuroscience, right? It's allocated it to GPUs and all sorts of other cool things um, and industry, but you know, an industry has created a lot of tools that are gonna be applicable here, but there's not been a dedicated like industry grade chip design effort for photonics for, for neuroscience. Um, so that's one of the things that's needed. Um, the other one that would be really cool would be to eventually figure out how to get MRI to directly see neural activity. So right now, um, MRI can see blood flow, uh, but it can't directly see neural activity. And there's been various attempts to do this, um, but they've been kind of very sporadic and isolated across different small groups, and they're getting debunked frequently by other groups. What if we just really like do a crash program to really figure out how to get MRIs to detect neural activity? Pretty high risk. It's not clear that there actually is a way, but um, several people have thought that there was a way and then ended up being debunked, so it's like not something that's totally impossible. Um, likewise for uh, magnetoencephalography, so somebody asked about EEG. MEG is much better because magnetic fields can just go can just penetrate um, much longer distances. Um, with EEG, you kind of have really fundamental, you know, lim limitations because you basically have a water, salt water, in between the neurons and what you're measuring. Whereas magnetic fields can just go go right through that. But the problem is you need a giant shielded room um, to be able to 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 do the magnetics. But what if you have like active cancellation of those magnetics, um, where you can you can uh, cancel out the Earth's magnetic field? Can you just be walking around with an MEG? Again, it's on the limits of possible, but it's the type of thing that doesn't require an effort the scale of the Hubble Space Telescope. It just requires like effort on the scale of like a, a well-funded deep tech startup to make a, a solid try at that. Um, and this is another one that we're doing. This is not exactly just brain, but this one that we're doing, um, trying to get going as a seedling project. Um, which is basically, it's about all the molecules, right, that are circulating in your blood, many of which are talking to your hypothalamus, talking to your brain. That's probably how some of the obesity drugs that are, are big now are working, is that they're talking to your hypothalamus in a particular way. Um, what if we could generalize this idea of a continuous glucose monitor to monitor hundreds of different uh, chemicals simultaneously? Again, quite a, quite a complicated effort for that, and a lot of what you want to do with that initially is not necessarily trying to make that wearable and just like everybody necessarily use that as a consumer product. You'd actually want to give that to researchers initially. And even if the form factor was suitable for researchers, but not yet suitable um, as a consumer uh, market, that would still be enormously valuable for science. And so it's very much worth doing, I think, a first iteration of that in a scientific, kind of pure scientific context. And then finally, there's, there's just a lot of supporting tooling. So we talked a little bit about optogenetics. We talked a little bit about sonogenetics. Just, just a matter of weeks ago, there's now, on the horizon, there's magnetogenetics. Um, so fluorescence that changes with magnetic fields. What if you can operate that in reverse? Um, that would be really powerful. Um, and you know, it's one of the most pro-like projects in the past in neuroscience is this project at, uh, called Genie that was at uh, Genelia, um, Howard Hughes Medical Institute um, campus, where they basically, they knew that getting a certain protein to really reliably report neural activity was just really pivotal. And so because they were a dedicated institute, they were able to put a lot of staff and a lot of focus, um, just kind of crank through many iterations of the design of this fluorescent protein um, called GCAMP. We need something like that for magnetogenetics. We probably also need it for like hundreds of other biosensors. So we need to kind of in industrialize um, biosensor development, basically. Um, and then finally, there's kind of just generalizing a little bit outside neuroscience. Sumner talked a little bit about how you know fMRI data, other data, sort of very fragmented. This is very true across biology overall. Um, we it would be really great to just have a, a digital model that just says, okay, 
what's the RNA, what's the protein, what's the metabolites, what's the image of the cell look like, what's the morphology look like, have a universal latent space representation of, of cells, of cellular state, right? So this goes way outside neuroscience. It goes also into other areas of biology um, where these kind of semi-industrialized efforts could really um, change the game in the same way that ImageNet changed the game for uh, AI training. So um, with that, uh, thanks. And Anastasia will tell you more about how we actually put together a